very warm welcome to our Honorable Chief Guest, Honorable Pro-Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, and all the deans, directors, faculty, and dear students. So ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let us welcome our worthy guest with flowers. I request our Pro-Chancellor, Dr. Dobra, to kindly welcome our worthy Chief Guest with flowers. And according to the Indian tradition, before we begin with today's program in this temple of learning, let us light the auspicious lamp. faculties and the students. I proudly welcome <coughs> Dr. Ajay Tripathi, MBBS, MS, FRCS from Glasgow, FRCS from Edinburgh, and FRC of Tungwazi from London. He is a consultant ophthalmologist and his super specialty, specialty interest is in ophthalmic surgery and cosmetic facial surgery and he works at Cambridge University. He is the honor, honorary senior clinical lecturer in the University of Birmingham examiner for FRCS for all the other colleges in ophthalmology. <coughs> Advisor consultant, appointed committee, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. To these committees, he is the advisor. He is advisor to the CESR, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, and also advisor to a Response, uh, dual sponsorship based on dual sponsorship program of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. He has published more than 30 research papers in various peer-reviewed international journals and he has participated in many conferences, has presented his views and papers in various national and international conferences. Dr. Ajat Ripati hails from uh, Rotak. He completed his MBBS from Rotak and subsequently he worked for some time as a senior research in the in, uh, Lady Adding Medical College, Delhi, and later he left for the UK and where he, after doing his various FRCS and other training programs, he became an honorary consultant in the campus. Dear friends, the science of medicine is the oldest science known to the mankind, which came along with the human civilization and perhaps it took, took roots in a systematic manner in this part of the world only, in this country only. Even before the time of Alexander's, Alexander when he came, and he took many Vedyas with him of that time, and knowledge of medicine with him, prior to that also, there has been a lot of interaction on the question of medicine with the <coughs> Greeks, and with the Egyptians, and other part of the world. It is said that this knowledge went first to the Middle East from India and then to the Europe and there it developed fully to the present form of what we call as the allopathic system or the modern system of medicine. <coughs> Today, Dr. Ajatra Tripathi, who has done very well in England and the UK, will tell you, advise you how to proceed, what kind of opportunities are available in the United Kingdom for the medicos as well as for the nursing staff. 
it's a very good thing <coughs> that he has come and he will be sharing his experience with you people so that you can prepare yourself to explore that part of the world. Now, with these words, I will request Dr. Zatipati to please come and uh, give his, deliver his lecture on this topic. It is a pleasant surprise to see an institution of this size. So many courses available, such a wonderful academy. And the first thing which came to my mind, and I spoke to Dr. Singh about it, that we must work seriously to get the institution recognized by General Medical Council so that we can establish long-term <coughs> future relationships with some of the institutions there so that the process which I'm going to explain to you becomes relatively straightforward and simple. Extremely thankful to all the organizers, all the faculty members, especially Dr. Sham Singla, who met me last week and uh, ordered me to come here. He can order me, he has been my teacher. One of the most wonderful teachers, the man who always knows the right balance between perfection and discipline. He has been a friend to us. He has been a mentor to us, a wonderful teacher, and I'm sure his presence here will give new vision, new direction to the institution, and all of you will take this institution further forwards. What I'm going to tell you today is uh, not really a very exhaustive talk. It is just an introduction because it's a very vast subject and there will be multiple questions coming to your mind. I will be able to answer them if I know the answers to those questions. If I don't know, I will guide you what will be the best place to find the answers to those queries. But one thing I can assure you that at the end of the talk, I will be giving you my email address you can have direct access to me if you have any questions. You can always ask your teachers if you have any questions, and we will try to help you as much as we can. Basically, the talk is about opportunities which are available in UK for doctors, nurses, paramedics, technicians, and other allied professions. The, as the things ex exist today, the route for doctors is the most difficult one. It's tedious, a lot of regulations. So a major part of the talk will be devoted to that, and then, I'll, uh, then I will also touch on some other things. The big question comes to mind, why UK? There are a number of countries which are equally attractive, which offer equally high standards of training and opportunities. But UK has got its own advantages, which I firmly believe that they are quite a big attractive feature. It's not very far off, just about eight and a half hours flight, and you are there. Another important thing is, it is a country, I have spent nearly 20 years there now, and I can tell you with confidence that people from all walks of life, all religions, they live quite happily together in great harmony, no problems whatsoever. The language they speak there is a language you already know. So there are no language barriers. It's a beautiful place to visit as well. You have a number of attractions which you can go and have a look. Those who are sports enthusiasts, 
they will have their good share of sports activities there. Those who li like night lives, I can assure you it is not boring. Those who like creative arts, theater, drama, everything is available. And a few words about NHS, National Health Services, which is the main, main pillar on which the health system of the United Kingdom is resting. It is the second largest employer in the world. The first being Indian Railways. So this is the second largest employer in the world. And I have no hesitation in saying that it is not one of the best, it is the best government-run health system in the world. <coughs> Due to various reasons, it's not a platform to discuss all those things, but it is an amazing system. It gives a huge emphasis on personal professional development. Whatever your aims, your objectives are, you will be able to fulfill them has got a system in place where everyone, anyone who is keen to take part in research is encouraged, the funding is available, the infrastructure is available. Everyone gets equal opportunity, which is very important. If you have talent, if you are hardworking, it will be difficult for anyone to stop you. There is no discrimination. It is well-paid job and very attractive pension plan later on. The training which is offered there is highly structured. When you join a training program, whether it is for one year or two years or five years, you have right in the beginning your full timetable. If it is a three-year program, what will happen in first six months, next six months, it is all written black and white and there is no deviation from that. The training is mainly divided into main two parts, mandatory training and the personalized training. Mandatory training is that part of the training which has to be done by each and every one, irrespective of what grade you are working on, what specialty, what specialty you are doing. And this includes like basic life support, audits, clinical governance, antimicrobial and equal opportunities, those sort of policies have to be known by everyone. Individually tailored training is, one is related to the department in which you are working, and secondly, related to what you really want to do. You have to identify your training objectives and then the training will be catered to your training needs. It will be closely monitored. Once everything has been agreed upon, once everything is in black and white, then it will be closely monitored whether you are achieving those goals or not. Achieving those goals is a combined joint responsibility of the trainee and the trainer. Say for example, you come to ophthalmology and the guidelines say that in first year of your training, you must do 50 phacoemulsification cataract surgeries. If you are not able to achieve that, the trainee will be asked why he has not been able to achieve that and the trainer will be asked equally why he has not been able to give an environment in which the trainee has, been able, has not been able to do 50 cases. So, there are no, no loopholes, whatever is decided will be delivered. In addition, you will have regular appraisals in which your progress will be monitored, will be documented, and then the areas for improvement will be identified and people will be working on them. That was about the NHS. Slowly the private sector is coming up. In UK, the health system is mainly driven by NHS. It is not mainly 
private sector which is controlling the health services, but it is slowly coming up with medical insurances coming up and uh, the new <coughs> clinical commissioning groups which have started working for the last two years. Some private providers are also coming, but they are expected to have the same standards of quality control as NHS. Sometimes people may feel that in private, in the, all these hospitals, they have to work slightly longer, but that is your own choice. No one is going to force you, no one is going to exploit you. And I think it is fair to say that you, if you work more, you will earn more. Now, what is the absolute essential thing that you need to have before you plan to head towards UK? You must have a job offer. Now, now it has become important because recently the immigration policy has changed so much that getting entry into UK has become very difficult. You must have an appropriate visa. Now, this is very really important. At times it happens that people, they take a visit visa, go there and hope that they will find the job. In the meantime, they will, and if they find the job, they will be able to get their visa changed. It will never happen. If you are on visit visa, you will have to come back after the duration <coughs> expires. If you apply for a change of visa while you are in the country, it will be red flagged and you will not be allowed entry a second time. So choose your visa category very carefully. If you just want to go and have a look, go on a visit visa. You can do a clinical observership on visit visa, but you will not be allowed to work. So, appropriate visa is very important. Your qualification has to be recognized by General Medical Council because every practitioner has to be registered with General Medical Council and that registration will not be given to you unless and until the basic medical qualification which you hold is recognized by GMC. Exam for English language, is also essential. And for different categories of individual, the IELTS scores are variable. Like most of the times they ask for a score of seven in all the components. But I think for Commonwealth <coughs> Fellowship programs, it is 7.5 in each and every component. Health status, keep your documentation ready for your immunization status, especially hepatitis B and some other conditions. The criminal record, well, you cannot enter if you are on the criminal register. You can enter the parliament here, but you can't enter there and work as doctor. So, it is not a very smooth walk, especially initially. There are many hurdles. And those hurdles, if you know well in advance, then you will be able to plan and make a move accordingly. One of the biggest hurdles is your visa application will be denied. I have seen many, many students and doctors who fill their application form very wrongly. Never hide an information and never provide a false information. Job offer, your financial details, letter from the employer, your health status, your criminal record, everything has to be submitted in the first attempt. <coughs> Once a question mark is put on your application, then it becomes slightly difficult to get it through. English exam has to be done. Start doing it around two years before you plan to go because the exam results are valid for two years since the time of passing. 
have a look at these websites. General Medical Council and General Dental Council for your routine information. And also, if you have special interests, if you're going to be a physician or a surgeon, or ophthalmologist or gynecologist, you can go to the website of the relevant royal colleges and find out information, what is needed, so that you can have all the paperwork ready for you. Now, what are the options? What are the various routes that doctors can take to enter UK? One is very old, well-known route of taking lab exam. Then the membership exam of the relevant Royal College is another route, which generally those who have finished their MBBS here and have done post-graduation, they like to take this route. Overseas fellowship programs, Commonwealth Fellowship Scheme, dual sponsorship program, and sometimes agency or direct recruitment. PLAB is well known to you. I will not give much time to it. It is held very, very frequently. There are some overseas centers as well. And you have to pass it. And that makes you eligible for registration. But that doesn't make you eligible for entry into UK. You need to have a job offer. One important thing you have to remember that if you are planning to have a dual sponsorship program, then please do not appear in PLAB exam. Because those who fail in PLAB exam, even once, they are not eligible to apply for dual sponsorship program. So you must know your path right from the beginning, what you want to do. And only if you want to come at a very early stage of your career, then I think PLAB is the best option because it gives you entry at the earliest level of training, and then you can take it forward. Membership exams, all the Royal Colleges have their own regulations, their own scheme of exams. Some exams are in two parts, some are in three parts, so it is always advisable to visit those websites. Overseas Fellowship Program is something which has been relatively recently started. And what is generally done that highly specialized training posts are offered to overseas candidates on a short-term basis. They are not very financially rewarding because these are not funded by NHS or local deanery. So the hospital, local hospital funds it. So salaries are on the lower side for this. But the advantage is that it is very, very highly focused program. Like if someone wants to come and do orbital surgery fellowship, for one year he will just be doing orbits, orbital surgery four or five theater sessions a week, special clinics, get your skills up, and you come back to your country. It will also be advisable to, before you embark on it, to find out whether the local deanery recognizes it. Advantage of that is that if the local deanery recognizes it, then it will be counted towards a part of your training. This will be helpful if you want to overstay for further training within UK. <coughs> Commonwealth Fellowship Scheme is more targeted for more experienced and senior doctors who are already qualified, already pursuing a special interest, and want to further their training in some specific field. This is centralized application, centralized selection program. And this is one of the programs where you need to have a score of 7.5 in your English test. Dual sponsorship is something which died down about four or five years ago, but is slowly getting revived again. And I think this is the easiest pathway at the moment 
because it cuts so much of paperwork and bureaucracy in between that it becomes very easy for the doctors to come and achieve their goals. Once you are, accept once you are accepted for this scheme, we will look after your GMC registration. You don't have to bother about it. We will look after your visa requirement. If you're coming with this scheme, you do not have to pass PLAP beforehand or any Royal College exam. And the training which will be offered to you will be again highly structured, well written down in your contract and will be delivered to you. Who is eligible? IMG, International Medical Graduate, anyone who has passed his basic medical qualification outside European Union is eligible for it. And another important thing is that primary medical education has to be recognized by GMC. There are certain institutes which are not recognized, so it will be wise to check on the website, the list of institutions which are recognized. And if not recognized, you can still write to them. Because the list is not updated all the time. New institutions are being added again and again. So it will be worthwhile writing to them. <coughs> These are the criteria. Anyone who is applying for the last five years, at least three years out of those five years, that person must have been in active medical practice. Otherwise, he cannot apply. The person should remain in active practice while the application is being processed. That is also important. And whatever you have done in the past as clinical observership or attachment will not be counted as your active clinical practice. So, which means in nutshells that three years of practice, in the last five years, and last 12 months active practice, also being in practice while the application is being processed. Again, same thing. The first rule is very important. No exception is made to this, that for the last 12 months, you must be engaged in clinical practice. And the reason for that is that they do not want to have a candidate who passed MBBS at some stage of the career, left any active practice, and suddenly after six years wakes up and says, OK, I, I want to start again. Let me go to UK. That is not possible. So for the last 12 months, you must be in active practice. When the application is being dealt with and the decision is being made, you still should be in your country of origin. You should not be in UK. It is not that you apply for dual sponsorship and then you come to UK, start doing an observership and wait for the results. No. <coughs> It will not happen. You apply, you stay in your country, wait for the decision. You must have worked at least for three years after qualifying as a doctor. That is also important. And that three year period is like maybe your internship or junior house job, senior house job, whatever it is. In UK, they call it first two foundation years, and then they start the training programs. A well-written CV, which should have your surgical log as well, to reflect what you have done so far. And this log has to be signed by your supervisor. And English exam with a score of seven in all the parts. Now, who is not eligible? These candidates cannot apply for dual sponsorship. Those who have failed their plan, even if it was many years ago, once you fail plan exam, then this scheme is totally ruled out for you. Important thing to keep in mind. Another category is 
it is not applicable to you, but it is within the rules, so I'm explaining you that there is a scheme for doctors who are already, already working in the UK, which is known as CESR, C-E-S-R. This is a scheme in which doctors who have not gone through the proper formal training, but has been there in the specialty for a fairly long period of time and have got the clinical skills, which are equivalent to what they would have achieved had they undergone the training. So those doctors, they apply for certificate for entry into specialty register. And then when their application is assessed, if some shortcomings are noticed, highlighted, then they are asked to say, well, you have to do this many surgery more, six months of this experience more. <laughs> Now, these candidates cannot apply for dual sponsorship to fulfill those aims and objectives because that is a totally separate route. Also, medical graduates who are members of European Union and have also qualified from European Union, they are not for this scheme. And equally, those who are not residents of European Union but have qualified from European Union, they have to write directly to GMC. They cannot have a dual sponsorship program unless GMC agrees. It is, for example, if someone goes from India, does MBBS in Spain, that is fine. But then they will have to write to GMC that I have qualified from Spain what is the route for me. Generally, there are four ways in which you can find entry into UK through dual sponsorship. Route A is the simplest route. In this, what happens that you have to find a UK consultant who is willing to take on the responsibility of training you. And your local national consultant should write to UK consultant. So you have an overseas consultant, you have a UK consultant who must know each other. They not only by writing or emails or letters, they must personally know each other. And then once the UK consultant is happy with the CV which has been sent, he will write to the relevant royal college that this candidate fulfills the criteria, this is the training he wants, and I am willing to provide the training for so much period of time. Generally, these programs are offered for a period ranging from six months to two years, but it is not uncommon to have them extended on a later recommendation. In route B, <coughs> The UK consultant may not be having a space available in his own unit, but if he knows the consultant from India, and if he knows what are the training requirements, then he can approach another consultant within UK to request to take that international medical graduate as a trainee. In this, it will be responsibility of the secondary UK consultant to constantly inform the primary UK consultant about the training progress so that they can feed back to GMC and to the local institution. In route C, the head of the institution within India can directly write to the Royal College that this is the candidate who wants to do this specific training. The then the Royal College will pass on the information to various consultants. If some of them are in interested, they will write back to Royal College and arrange the scheme. And the last scheme is, if someone is already doing some course in UK, like some research or PhD or something, and he wants to overstay, then the person who was supervising his work has to write to GMC. And in this, only in this situation, you don't have to have a sponsor from your country of origin. 
Now, who can be UK sponsor when you are choosing your UK sponsor? Obviously, has to be registered with GMC and has to be on specialist register and should hold honorary or substantive post actively. Should not be a retired consultant. A retired consultant cannot sponsor you. And as I said earlier, must know the overseas consultant on a personal level. Recently, the trend has started of direct or agency recruitment, especially since the private sector has started coming up. You have to be very careful that you are not falling into wrong hands. You must get in touch with your prospective employer to find out whatever information has been provided to you. Is it correct or not? If they fail to divulge the details of your employer, be slightly suspicious because everything must be very transparent. Never pay any fees to these agents because these agents are getting paid by the organization which has given them responsibility to recruit the doctors or paramedical workers. You must not pay a single penny to them. Only the visa fees has to be paid, which will be in the embassy. No money exchanges hands in the agent's office. Very important for you to know. If you have any doubt about any agency, please check with British Embassy. They are very transparent. You give the name of the agent of the agency and find out whether this agency is really authorized to get the doctors recruited. They will tell you an answer, yes or no. So be very careful with direct recruitment. Direct recruitment is more in fashion at the moment for nurses and paramedics. There is a huge market for nurses at the moment. Huge market. Many vacancies, lot of need. So this is something which can be exploited very soon. About three years ago, they started going to Eastern European countries to get nurses from there. but. Eventually, they realized they were not happy with the standards of training those nurses get. And you will be pleased to know that they are extremely happy with the training program of Indian nurses, Indian doctors. They are very keen to have them. And almost every three months, NHS delegations are coming to India to recruit nurses. So far, their focus of attention has been in the southern part of India. Mostly they come to that side because somehow there is an impression that nursing training is mainly focused within southern part of India. So it's a matter of promoting that it is available in other parts as well so that they start coming to other institutions as well. For nurses and paramedics and technicians, they are also doing direct or agency recruitment. And it will be a good idea to write to the relevant councils, like General Nursing Council, to explore what are the options for nurses to come and work there. The nurses play a very important part in the healthcare delivery system in UK. They are on the front line. Some of them do general nursing. Some of them become specialist nurses. Now, the concept of specialist nurses, they get specifically trained in few things, and then they see those patients independently. They run those clinics. There may be some small, minor procedures which they are allowed to do, and they can do it. Then the next step is nursing consultants. They have acquired so much experience that they are running independent units with many specialist nurses working under them. And majority of them, after a certain amount of experience, are able to take up administrative roles as well. So at the moment, there is a huge potential market for nursing staff to come to UK. Paramedics, I mean, I can tell you, these paramedics are so well trained 
that when when a real emergency comes, I have seen doctors who may find themselves out of their depth, but these guys are so well trained, they look after the victim at the site so well that majority of patients are saved. In the last so many years, of course exceptions are there depending on how severe MI is, what is the age, what are the other risk factors, but to the best of my knowledge, I have not heard a single death due to heart attack in UK over the last 15 or 16 years. There is a response time, the paramedics with ambulance and all the things will reach you wherever you are in the country within three to seven minutes once the call has been made. You may be in the remotest possible area and everything which needs to be done on the site will be done and the patient will be transferred. There have been instances where from the time of making the phone call to angioplasty within the hospital, the time 40 to 45 minutes, not more than that. So it's a very robust mechanism and paramedics, they, pay, they play a very important role and that is the reason they are very, very highly paid. The training is difficult, it is very stressful. Some of them leave this training in the initial parts, but once they fulfill the training, they are a big asset to the health system there. This, in nutshell, is what I had to say. It's a very big topic on each and every route. We can talk for hours together, but I will say just note on my email if you have any questions. I will try my best to answer. Thank you very much. If you have any questions regarding your chances of going abroad, he will be available with us. You can interact with him after this function. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now all stand up for the national anthem, please. <laughs>